Today's topic is a little bit different. Rajiv has worked on the insurance companies. How do we have to look at insurance companies? Because this is the first time that insurance companies are, uh, would be coming to the market with IPOs. It's a question of another six months to eight months. And uh, insurance investing is a very relatively new business uh, for us, especially the investors. How do you look at an invest, uh, uh, look at an insurance company? And so, Rajiv is going to be talking about that. Markets, nothing to do with the markets. They are as as they are, as they were about a month back, or even two months back. So the markets are boring. So when the markets are boring, what we have to do is we have to learn something more, which would be useful to us when we make our investment decisions. As Paragraph mentioned, uh, so far we don't have any pure play insurance company which is listed in the market. <coughs> many, many years back, probably uh, very few of us in this room were alive at that time. We had private insurance companies and then all of them were nationalized. Then you had one uh, life insurance corporation of India and you had one general insurance corporation of India. and. These two companies pretty much ran insurance in India. LIC in the life space and GIC with its subsidiaries in the general insurance space. So, uh, somewhere uh, at the turn of the century, you had change in regulation, whereby private players were allowed to enter this space. You had various companies coming in to this business at various points in time. Today what we are looking at is the framework as to how do we really look at an insurance company balance sheet, how do we compare to companies, what are the key parameters to look for. We are not getting into uh, valuation of an individual company or what is a buy and what is not a buy because these are not listed as yet. We are laying the groundwork on which we, uh, a few months down the line we can build a structure as in when the prospectus comes out or the IPO comes out. In fact, in India there is a paucity of people who can understand this business because for maybe one full generation or two generations you did not have actuaries as a profession. You had actuarial society but you, that would turn out maybe a handful of actuaries all of whom would find employment with LIC. Analysts are not attuned to evaluating insurance companies so it will be a new thing for them and so far whatever research reports I have seen from the brokerages they have mainly real, uh, relied on the numbers that the management gives them, the promoters of the company give them and then they arrive at some embedded value. So if you are evaluating let's say Bajaj Financial Services, Bajaj Finserv, the analyst will rely on what value the Bajaj group has put on their insurance business and then they will work around it. So today we are looking at the nuts and bolts of that. As I mentioned there are broadly two categories. You have one which is life, the other which is general. Within life insurance, you have the traditional policies which we have been seeing from LIC. You had the term insurance policies, endowment policies. Uh, within that, you will have all sorts of variants, single premium and multiple premium and all of that. You also have annuities. Annuities are products which are taken by people who typically retire. At the time of retirement they get a lump sum amount and they buy this annuity which gives them a regular income over their lifespan. The last uh, category in life insurance is unit link which is more of a recent introduction to the Indian markets. Recent meaning last 4-5 years. This is 
what has been pushed most by private insurance companies. Unit linked in a way is not too difficult to understand. It's actually like a mutual fund. People put in money. If the investments do well, the policyholder benefits. If the investments go down, it's policyholder's loss. That's the most part. Plus it has a small risk cover. But most of it is investment and very little of it is insurance. So to understand insurance, we look at the first two types, traditional and annuities. And finally, we have general insurance, where again you have car, medical, marine, etc., various kinds of insurance. We quickly run through our checklist. So, uh, in the past, we have always been harping on buy companies with good promoters, good management, number one. Number two, the business should be good, that is, it should have good return on capital. It should not require too much of borrowings. It should not be too capital intensive. It should be predictable. There should be some entry barriers, all of those. So we quickly run through that checklist. Are there quality promoters? You have good quality names, people like SDFC, people like the Bajaj Group. Good promoters are there. So that is a tick mark. Business per se is not very difficult to understand. If you uh, really get around five or six key terminologies, if you get around five or six key uh, features of the insurance business, it's not too difficult to understand. So hopefully at the end of this presentation, we'll have some grounding over there. It's also predictable. It's not like, uh, it's not a fad or a fancy. Insurance business has been around for many, many years, many, many decades. And possibly it will be around for many more years to come. So it's not a business which is uh, flavor of the month kind of a business right now. We will see the return portion. I think the business is attractive especially in the context of the life insurance business. We'll look at the returns uh, part as we go along. It is capital intensive. So it's not like, uh, let's say, the credit rating agents, uh, C business where you just put in capital once and then you keep growing your business. Because insurance is a multi-year contract and People pay premiums regularly over the lifespan and then they expect the company to pay out in case something happens to them. The regulators and the government wants to be very sure that the company itself will be around to meet its liability. So that's why, like a bank, there are stringent capital requirements on the companies. They have to put in a lot of money up front and also keep pumping in more money as the size of their business grows. So it is capital intensive. However, capital intensive has to be taken in context. Capital intensive is good if return on capital is good and the money is not getting locked up somewhere. So here, the capital has to be in the form of net worth. It is not that some plant or machinery is uh, being set up or some fixed asset is being created. It's just the act of putting up net worth to provide comfort to the uh, policy holders. Today we'll be mainly looking at life insurance. Uh, this is the segment which has started showing profits and where one can see the gestation period getting over and we probably have an opportunity <coughs> to invest. Also the initial IPOs in all likelihood will be from the life insurance space rather than the general insurance space. So the way the business is structured in India is you have a separate company which does life insurance business and you have a separate company which does general insurance business. It's not that all the companies which started in this space are making money. 
people who were serious players, people who have a banking distribution network and a brand name, those are the players who have really started uh, gaining traction and who have started making some money. In general insurance, uh, as I said, they are still making losses. So we will again come back to these businesses as some more time goes by and we have some more data. We will run through some very elementary things. This probably all of you all know, but we will still reiterate it so that we are clear as we go ahead. In the beginning, there is a contract which is called a policy between an individual and the company. It's usually a multi-year contract. Here, unless you pay some money up front, the contract does not begin. So, any life insurance policy or annuity policy, first, some money has to move from the account of the individual to the bank account of the insurance company. That's how it starts. In some cases, it is a single payment. So, it could be a single premium policy or a purchase of an annuity. In other cases, it is a regular premium kind of contract. And finally, this is the key feature of our insurance. This is what distinguishes insurance from something like banking. Even in banking, you pay money upfront as a deposit when you open a fixed deposit or a savings account and then you get the money later. So what is the difference between a bank deposit and an insurance contract? In the insurance contract, the payout happens when something happens, usually death of an individual. Or in the case of an annuity, the payout keeps happening till the person is alive and the payout will stop when the person dies. So this is the key variant here as compared to other financial products. <coughs> and as we discussed, ULIPs are more like mutual funds. So except for the small insurance component, most of it is, is investment. So for an insurance company, what are the sources from which it gets cash flow? First one is obvious, they get premium income from policy holders. The second one also should be in a way obvious, when they get premium income and payout is going to happen after many years, so what do, what do they do with that money? They don't keep it in the current account, they invest it somewhere and on those investments, they have interest, dividend and capital gains. These are the two main sources of income. You could have other sources like late payment charge for a premium or interest on loan taken, etc. But the first two are the major sources of revenue. Expenses, again, first one is pretty obvious. Insurance is something which is hard sold to people. Commissions form a major portion of the premium, especially in the initial years for a life insurance contract. You have typical op operating expenses. These are expenses like uh, rent of premises, employee salaries, electricity bills, collection charges. There could be various operating expenses. Third is when you actually have to make a payout to the policy holder. When a person dies, you pay the uh, benefits under the policy or when you pay out money under an annuity contract. That is the outflow for the insurance company. And there are some policies where if the investments do well, a portion of that benefit is given to the policy holder. These are called participating policies, usually endowment kind of policies and hence there is something called a bonus which is given to policy holders. So this bonus is again an expense for the insurance company. So unlike 
a typical company for a let's say a trading company revenue minus expense is usually profit that is not the case with an insurance company so we'll again look at it premium income all of that is not profit because of timing differences because income is received up front and payout may happen many years later you can you cannot simply take all the income not provide anything for expenses and pay out money to shareholders otherwise there would be nothing left for policy holders so a big portion of the premium and investment income is allocated by an insurance company for future payouts to the policy holders we'll look at some of the uh, numbers for hdfc standard life and uh, i say say prudential but basically the biggest drivers for an insurance company's profit or an insurance company's loss is this how much do you provide for future payments if you provide less the profits will go up if you provide more the profits will go down dramatically and this is something which is very difficult to estimate it is something which is estimated by professionals who are called actuaries in a insurance company and again these provisions depend on something called mortality assumptions and future investment rate assumptions so this is one again it depends on past performance of investment returns and mortality how we come to that again <coughs> now probably some of you may be aware that in the initial years insurance companies rack up huge losses so people may be wondering why this is so and typically people assume that oh it takes a lot of set up expenses and that's why there are huge losses however that is not the only reason because entities like the government of india and irda whose job is to protect the interest of policy holders what they do is they are ultra conservative in their method of accounting they require insurance companies to make huge provisions towards future payouts and they require insurance companies to write off all the expenses up front when this happens the profits shown in the initial years are far lower than what they actually are and hence there are hidden reserves in balance sheets of insurance companies so how do we analyze insurance companies how do we look at two different companies one simple thing is expense ratio so relative to the premium income that a company is generating how much are they spending on their operating expenses the lower the better obviously then how are they accounting for future payouts a company which is conservative in accounting for future payouts has higher hidden reserves at the same time someone who is saying we'll not require too many future payouts and let's keep very little of provision they are probably showing more profits right now but their profits in the future years will be lower again uh, there is this terminology favorable selection versus adverse selection so if the let's say the indian population is the same you have mortality tables for the entire indian population however if you sell your life insurance policies only to non smokers you will probably have less of payout as compared to the general population also if you sell your policies only to 
people in the larger cities where there is a lot of access to uh, modern healthcare facilities, then your payouts will be lower. So, how good a company is at in evaluating risk and selling policies, that also plays a role. And finally, you cannot just look at the existing numbers and put a price to book multiple or price to earning ratio. You also need to factor in the hidden reserves. What you need to do is the current earnings and current book value should be reasonable as a percentage of the market price that you are paying and hidden reserves should provide you the upside from a long term investment. There are just some questions, how do these things affect insurance company profits? Let us say people live longer than what was originally estimated. What will happen to profits of an insurance company? Mayol says will go up. That is correct for life insurance policies. That is exactly opposite for annuity policies. So where you are writing a life insurance policy, if a person lives for 30 years only, you will have to make the payment at that age. Whereas if the person lives another 20 years, your payment is delayed by 20 more years, so the present value is far lower. You will get the investment returns on that money for 20 more years. In the case of a pension plan or an annuity product, if you have assumed that a person will live to the age of 80, and the person actually ends up living to the age of 90 or 95, then the insurance company has to keep writing out checks till the time the policy holder is alive. So that's how it affects the profits of an insurance company. The longer a person lives, the more the profits for an insurance contract and the lesser the profits for an annuity contract. Investment returns. If the insurance company has assumed an investment return of let's say 8% and actually they achieve 10%, obviously it's more profitable to the shareholders of the insurance company. If the expenses are higher than estimated, obviously profits are lower than what would have been otherwise. And interest rates going up. If interest rates go up, this is somewhat counterintuitive to people who look at banks. In the case of banks, when rates move up, their bond portfolio's value decline and people usually treat that as a negative for the banking sector. For the insurance sector, it's somewhat opposite. Reason being that insurance companies are not so driven by mark-to-market considerations, but they are more driven by future investment returns. So if some money is to be paid after 30 years, the present value of that will be higher when interest rates are at 5% than when interest rates are at 10%. So the higher the rates, the lower the provision required for meeting the future expenses. Before we get into anything else, let us look at the risks of buying an insurance company. What can go wrong with an insurance company? We have a live example in the case of Japan. Now, Japan has had a bear market in equities for maybe 20-30 years, for a very long time. Also, their interest rates are close to zero. So, what would have happened to the insurance companies over there. They would have taken premiums from the population assuming a certain investment return on those funds. Their equity portfolios would have fallen 
over many many years and their bonds would not be giving them any yield whereas the expenses would be the same so you had many uh, insurance companies going bankrupt in japan and also some of the insurance companies had bought foreign investments and yen appreciated versus other currencies so that also resulted in losses so that this is what can go wrong if there is a severe bear market and if there is a uh, record low interest rate regime otherwise usually it is a good business to be in we we'll keep discussing mortality tables so i just wanted to uh, portray what does the mortality table actually look like this is a real life mortality table this is what is used by insurance companies so let us say 100000 babies are born and they are live at birth so we are excluding death at the time of childbirth so 100000 babies are born 163 are expected to die within the first year and these many people will survive till the next year so this is the probability of a newborn child dying in the next one year <coughs> and so on and so forth so obviously as people grow older their probability of dying goes up in the first year it's pretty high 163 it declines for some time and then it again picks up so if there are 280 99 year olds living insurance companies will expect 108 of them to die before they turn 100 and out of the 100000 people who start off 172 are expected to live up to the age of 100 years this is what the table looks like the actuary is of course use only this column i have just put these three columns for simple understanding actuary is only concerned with the probability of dying in a particular year we will also look at an insurance company balance sheet before we go further so this is the balance sheet of hdfc standard life insurance these numbers are in thousands so they had 2200 9 crores of shareholders money of net worth at the end of march 2020 so let's see whether they are making a fair bit of profit we'll just go and see the profit after tax they made 271 crores on that in fact you can see they've just turned around in this year so from a loss in the previous year it just come to profit of 271 crores 271 crores on the net worth of 2209 crores so around somewhat more than 10% and now that they have turned around we can expect it to go up to let's say 15% 20% if we look at so all along that took this well yes yeah. what are the what are the accumulated losses accumulated losses we don't know the peak because that won't be visible in this balance sheet or maybe it will be last year's would be the peak day
this one debit balance and profit and loss account. So thousands, millions, 1565 crores. That was the peak over the for a period of more than a decade. So I think we are, we are getting the impression that insurance company mm. don't use too much of mathematics, it's very empirical. That calculation. That calculation. It is they use quite a bit of mathematics. No, we we manufacture, we know exactly what we are buying. Sorry? When we manufacture we know exact costs of everything. Mm -hmm. No, I will tell you how, how that works. Empirical means what? That's the question. So, if you, you have taken life insurance policy anytime in the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, you would have seen people, if, if the policy amount is large enough, they will ask you to go for medical tests. Then they will give you, this is what you, is your baseline uh, insurance premium. If you have certain medical conditions, they load the premium. Or if, if there is something favorable, they could bring it down, which is usually rare, but theoretically that is possible. So what are those? Empirical, yes, but even for empirical, there is a whole army of statisticians, mathematicians, actuaries who work out all these mortality tables. It's not, this table is not census data. It's not that they took a record of 100,000 people and they kept on observing them for 100 years. It's not come through that. Because, <coughs> You have to factor in future in, uh, advances in medical technology. You have to factor in other diseases coming in, things like HIV or uh, prevalence of cancer as and heart diseases as lifestyle change and so on and so forth. So it, it, this is not something which is cast in stone. That thing itself keeps going up and down. The mortality table is revised frequently. Also, they need to have. Uh, a mechanism whereby they can increase or decrease premium rates based on factors like male, female, smoker, non-smoker, obese and non-obese, all of these things. So that requires quite a bit of mathematics and research. And what's the increase in life? Uh, increase in mortality? Uh, mortality was at about 43 years, 43 now 60 years. So they have to keep revising these tables. Usually it happens every 5 years or 10 years that mortality table is revised. So if we look at at potential ICICI, then they have a net worth of around 4,951 crores. And against that, they have made a profit of 1,384 crores. This is not bad. So, all the pain that was there for the initial 12 years, they are now recovering those losses and starting to make profits. How will it protect themselves in case of the natural disaster? Reinsurance re 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 is more mm -hmm. relevant for general insurance. And in life, even if you have a big earthquake or a uh, big flood or something, it's usually localized. So if you are writing policies uh, all over India, then it may not make so much of a difference. However, they do use reinsurance wherever they feel 
there is concentration of risk. So this broadly shows that it's a profitable business. It's HDFC Standard Life turned around and Prudential ICIC has been making profits for a few years and it's not a bad business to be in. Now if we just look at the balance sheet and PNL, we quickly see some differences. This is pretty standard in terms of net worth which is there. However, there is something called policy holders funds. This you see only in insurance companies. This is not there in any of the uh, balance sheet. In the case of banks, you will have deposits over here. In the application of funds, there is a strange thing over here. In investments, you have two categories. You have investments which are shareholders investments and you have investments which are policy holders investments. So at the investment level itself, they split it out into two categories. For dividend purposes. Also to show how much money has been kept aside for policy holders. And profit and loss itself is split up into two statements. You have something called a shareholders account. This is your typical profit and loss account. And you have something called revenue account. This is called policy holders account. So first they say this is to drill into the minds of the general public as well as the insurance company that premium is a cash flow, it's not your profit. So first you have premium on which comes here. If you have reinsured then this goes out. If you see the reinsurance amount it's not large, it's not material compared to the premium on all. Apart from premium you have income from investments. All of these are income from investments. You have contribution from the shareholders account. In some cases the insurance company may be required to make good some money to policy holders. That is over here. Usually it's not a very large sum unless the company is making a lot of losses. So this is the revenue. From that they have to pay out commissions. They have to pay out operating expenses relating to business. This is your normal operating expenses, salaries, rent, etc. But what about payment tax fee to uh, policy holders? That will come. So there are various income. segments. There is first revenue, that is total of A. Then you have total for B. You will have more things coming in. This is benefits paid. This is what is actually paid out against claims made on the company. You also have interim bonuses paid, terminal bonuses paid and this is a big item here, 5325 crores. which is debited as an expense over here. Now this is where those assumptions come in and whether you are conservative or not conservative. So really your final profit and loss here you have a surplus of which something is transferred to the shareholders account. So this amount plays a big role in determining how much profit or how much loss is reported 
in the case of an insurance company. It is deserves a lot of that. Yes. Now if we go back to the profit and loss account, there was an amount transferred to shareholders account. This came in from there. Apart from that, uh, even here you have income on investments. Why is that? Because investments are categorized into two. You have shareholders investments and you have policy holders investments. The reason for segregation is if this was not to be segregated, then what the insurance company will do? All the investments which are performing well, they will say return on these investments is for shareholders. Investments which are not going well, this is for policy holders, so that they have to pay off a lower proportion of that as bonuses. So to prevent that, you have clear cut categorization and the income here is from shareholders investments. Then you have a small amount of expenses which are not allowed to be debited to policy holders and remaining is the profit. 271 pros as we <coughs> saw. It. So they, they don't pay tax on the, on the investment of policy yeah, so holders? No, they don't pay tax on the income for policy holders. Because they are not showing it as income. It is not their income. So in a way, on those investments, the government does not get tax at the company level, neither do they get tax when the benefits are paid out to People want wider acceptance of uh, insurance as a product so that people's lives don't go haywire in case of death or in case of medical emergency. It's, 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 it's a favored investment vehicle or it's a favored vehicle for financial <laughs> You have to have that kind of horizon. So the we saw SDS standard life eleven years they made a loss, twelfth year they made a profit first time. Potential ICICI, they have been making profits for a few years now, but initially maybe 8 years, 10 years were a loss. However, after those 8 10 years, if you are consistently going to make 20 30 percent, then it's a good business. Also, those initial years, in the true sense, there were no losses, they, they were creating some hidden reserves. See, when you market a product which is a contract for 30 years and you expense out all the marketing expenses in the first year itself, then all your expenses are front loaded and the benefits will come over a longer period of time. That is one. And second is the conservative accounting which happens. I come to that conservative accounting, how do they account for future liabilities? Also, because it's a new company, they may be collecting premium and the debts occur immediately. Here, over a period of time, they will have less proportion number of policy holders. Sorry, I didn't get that. See, when you are starting a company in the first year and you got maybe one lakh policies, so you immediately have a payoff. Right? But over a period of time, when they build reserves, and the number of people dying will get reduced you in proportion. You don't have to the policy. Somebody will take the policy and die. Yeah, the number of policy orders is less. No, see, if you, if you come here, let us say. It's right because. See, let us say you write 100,000 policies, all of them written in the first year. You get premium on 100,000 policies up front. Out of that, if 163 people die, so be it. It's part of the business. 
you pay out those 163 b. It doesn't matter whether it's a new company or old company in that sense. What matters is all the operating expenses have to be borne by those 100,000 policies. As you move to the next year, you write 100,000 policies more. Yeah. Your operating expenses will be divided over 200,000. So operating expenses, not the payout. Volume increases, policy volume increases, then your... Yes. That is also a factor. So for, luckily for us, we don't have to step into the shoes of ICICI Bank or HDFC. When these IPOs come, all the gestation period will be over. We will be buying into a profit making company. Now depending on how much premium there is and what is the valuation, you have to of course buy it only at the right valuation. But as minority shareholders, we will not bear that gestation period. This may look like a very complicated formula, but we have learnt it in high school. Uh, it's, I learnt it somewhere 7th or 8th standard. Got Amount it. after a few years equal to principal into 1 plus rate of return or interest raised to the number of years. This is if you want to accumulate any money for future. If you have a sum in future and you, if you want to know the present value of that, which is you have A and you want to find out P, then you take this whole term, you bring it down here, you will get a discount value. This is normal compound interest, normal finance. Most finance will use this. Now what happens in the case of an insurance company? How do they uh, value the future liabilities? How do they price the premium? Because the, this N is unknown. You may have a sum assured, a term insurance policy for 5 lakhs. So you have 5 lakhs which is known. You will have a rate of return which is known. I can generate 10% by investing in bonds. So even this is known. But you don't know when that payout is to happen and you also don't know if that payout is to be made. All that is uncertain. So how does the insurance company work out? They use the mortality tables. So in the case of life insurance, it is finance plus probability, the combination of these two. So let us say there is a simple policy, term insurance policy, no complication. Tenure is 3 years. Let us say sum assured is 10,000 rupees. And premium paid is 500 per annum. And probability of dying each year is 2%. I have taken very rough numbers just for simplicity's uh, sake to understand how insurance mathematics works. We have said premium is 500 per year. So, on day 0 or before the start of the policy, you have to receive 500. Otherwise, the policy does not start. So, cash inflow 500, present value 500. At the end of one year, you will get the second premium, provided the person is alive. So probability of getting that is 0.98 because probability of dying is 2%. So 500 into 0.98, this is what will be received after one year. After two years, you will get 500 into 0.98, the person has to survive one year and the person also has to survive the second year to pay you the second premium. So this is the inflow that they will get. What is the outflow? We are assuming that the person, the payout has to be given at the end of the year rather than in between for simply to say. 10,000 is to be paid out. 
and there are two percent chance. In the second case, you will pay ten thousand to people who survived the first year and then died. In the third case, you will give ten thousand to people who survived the first year, second year, and died in the third year. Once you have these numbers, then you can use the standard compound interest formula to get the present value or future value. So it's not really that difficult. Once you average it out over a large number of policyholders, the amounts are more or less within a certain range, and then you can use the standard compounding, discounting methods and work on that. Can you read this at the back or not? No. No. Okay. Uh, I'll read it out probably. See here, in an insurance company balance sheet, this is the section which is the most important actuarial method and assumptions. As we saw in the case of uh, SDFC Standard Life Insurance, see here profit for the year is 271 crores, whereas the provisions that they have made. are 5,325 crores in the year. Now, if 5,325 crores, instead of that you had 5,525 crores, just an increase of 200 crores, most of the profit would have been wiped out for the year. Whereas, if instead of 5,325 crores, you had 5,000 crores, your profit would have shot up dramatically. So, this is the key factor which is affecting the profit and loss account and this is driven by the actual assumption. So that assumption becomes very relevant in the case of a life insurance company. The biggest assumption will be appearing in a single line like this. The interest rates, I will read out for people who can't read at the back. The interest rates used for valuing the liabilities are in the range of 4.93 to 6.02 percent per annum. This is the interest rate that ICICI Prudential has assumed they will be able to generate in future years for the future liabilities. Any comment on this interest rate? 4.93 to 6.02? Lower actually. It's significantly lower than the interest rate we are seeing in the market today. Any retail depositor can go to a bank and get a minimum of 9% today. On lower their than bank than the previous year also. Yes. In the previous year they had assumed 6.16 to 6.86. Why would you go down to 4.9? You have seen the next 20 years. Huh? Also, don't they invest in G sex and all which give lower rates of interest? These rates are even lower than G sex rates. G sex are also giving higher, <coughs> and apart from G sex, they buy corporate bonds, PSU bonds, they invest in various things. So, most interest rates today are higher than 6.0. Or all the interest rates, I would say. Not also, most. It's, it's a function of what the policy holders choose to invest in. No. Especially it's, it's in uh, ULIPs. No, we say nothing to do with ULIPs. It's nothing to do with ULIPs. In ULIPs, uh, aren't they uh, uh, given a choice to uh, uh, decide where to invest that, the investment part of For that? ULIPs, this does not matter. In the case of a ULIP, it's like a mutual fund. Any benefit which accrues comes to the policyholder's account 
any harm which happens goes to policy holders. This is relevant only for traditional policies. Traditional policies like term insurance, endowment, and the risk component of ULIP. This is not relevant for the typical ULIP component, investment component of ULIP. So if you go to the balance sheet, you have investments, you have shareholders investments, which is this, you have policy holders investments, which is this, 8A, and you have assets held to cover linked liabilities. Linked liabilities is unit linked liabilities, ULIPs. So most of the business so far for them has been coming from ULIPs, which is now changing. ULIPs have fallen out of favor. Now traditional policies are coming back in uh, play. So this portion is not affected by those actual assumptions. Those assumptions are relevant only for the traditional policies. And they are far lower than what the prevailing interest rates are. Very interesting question, why have the rates fallen as compared to last year? Why are the assumptions lower than uh, last year. Look at HDFC standard life. They are assuming 4.4 to 6.2. And last year they had assumed 4.4 to 5.2. So HDFC standard life has actually increased <coughs> the assumption of the future interest rates that they will get. If they had not done this, if 5.2 had not gone up to 6.2 in this year, they would have still reported a loss. Isn't it arbitrary? Like a LIBOR rate is fixed. Isn't there a... LIBOR rate is what is the rate today? Which, if someone were to ask you what is the 10 year GSEC rate today, you will get within a range of one or two basis points. But if you are asked to estimate the 10 year GSEC rate over the next 30 years and Mehul is asked to estimate, both of you need not have the no, same what estimate. What I am saying is it may be different estimates. Then somewhere along the line it should be a standard so that all insurance companies follow the same estimate. Here by playing with the interest rates you are calculated. IRBA doesn't have to do this. If they assume too high a interest rate, they will say, oh, you are taking policy shareholders' funds and distributing to shareholders. But if they are below 6 and a half when market rate is much higher, they will not object to whether you took 6.2 or 5.2 or whatever. So in this case, what we can see is, Here I can actually see an attempt to show lower profits in the case of Prudential ICICI. And in the case of SDSC Standard Life Insurance, I actually see a attempt to show some profits. 11 years we haven't shown any profit, let's show a profit this year. And even at 6.2 it's still a conservative estimate. So now an analyst who only goes by management numbers or who only tracks price to book or price to earnings from the reported numbers will be wondering where all these swings in profits and losses are coming. So this is the key thing to watch out. Is it shareholder or the policy? This one. Is it shareholder fund or policy fund? For both. This is for policy holders funds. Because on this, for shareholders funds you don't need any estimate. Whatever you get, you get. This assumption will determine how much money you keep aside in policy holders investments. If instead of 6% you assume 20%, then you have to keep very little aside for policy holders. 
because your funds will grow at 20 percent and meet the liability. So, insurance business technology is very you can never have an IPO for a new insurance company. It's for 11, 12 years, there is no profit on this. Correct. So, actually, when mature, so that's the time they can. Correct. So, IRDA has a guideline. You can come out with the IPO only after 10 years. So, who's coming out now with an IPO? First of the blocks would be companies like. ICSA Prudential, SCFC Standard Life, SBI Life Insurance, people who have been around for some time, people who have fraction, people who have Profit. some profits, people who have a brand name, distribution network. So it's unlikely you will have Bharati XR kind of company coming out initially with the All of them are in different segments. So Reliance doesn't have the kind of traction that these people have been having. Bajaj Alliance is big in uh, general. General insurance, general insurance is more prevalent. If you have uh, auto insurance all over the country, then accidents happen with a certain frequency or floods happen with a certain frequency. It's general insurance for uh, some events, some uh, large events are risky. So, the kind of uh, policies that Ajit Jain writes in Berkshire Hathaway, those are what are called the uh, mega catastrophe uh, policies or whatever. So, if one hurricane Katrina comes or one tsunami happens in Japan or something, then there are these big losses which come. Otherwise, if you are writing medical insurance policies for a large number of people or if you are uh, writing marine insurance, diversified, then it would not be uh, so risky. Thanks. So, I hope I have been able to yeah, yeah, I have one question. question. Uh, mobile is this a high dividend paying uh, sector in stock? That's a very good question for which I don't have a very good answer. Uh, I have uh, to tell you the truth, the way I started out with this is the first time I opened a insurance balance sheet, I couldn't make nothing out of it. Did not it. So I enrolled for actuary course. I studied some papers. I could not complete the course because then it became too complicated and it was in any case not related to my core investing field. But I understood enough to be able to read an insurance company balance sheet and I have been looking at Indian companies. I haven't looked at too many international companies. I have been working on laying a groundwork Actual work will start when the prospectors get spied for the first IP. Uh, we are still some uh, way from that. Insurance is the biggest business in the world. No, but do they pay dividends? My question is upfront. Berkshire does not pay dividends. But Berkshire is not in life insurance. Berkshire is in general. Let, let us know in the next meeting if you get this data. Sure. They are nice capital to this lovely Buffett has a uh, very good observation on this. He says most companies frame a dividend policy like this. Let's say we will on an average pay out twenty percent of our profits and we'll try to keep dividends stable from year to year. Or we'll pay fifty percent of our profits and try and keep things stable. He says that makes no sense whatsoever. He says dividend policy should be simple. Is the money more valuable in the shareholders pocket or more valuable in the company's bank account? 
if the company if the company is able to generate return on capital which is higher than what the investor can otherwise generate it should plow back everything and the day the reverse holds true it should pay out 100% as long as they are getting uh, investment opportunities berkshire hathaway recently they have said that we will start uh, share repurchases that is another way of returning money to shareholders in share repurchases what happens is people who want cash flow they can sell and get money for their shares and people who want to stay invested and don't have need for cash flow can remain invested in the shares so that is another way of returning cash so workshire has started repurchases program so dividend is not there for or if you want dividend you sell off a part of your share you say it's a quoted company it's a quoted company This is more than hundred thousand per share. Yeah. And that's why he came out with B group share, so that few you know, small people could uh, at least the same thing. I know you want to do all the investment in game only. Then came out. Till then it was only Buffett's brain working. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Hey anyway, guys, I don't think when the publication comes, you tell us whether we have to invest or not. <laughs>